The U.S. Senate today forged ahead with the second impeachment trial of former President Trump after it voted yesterday, 56 to 44, that it had jurisdiction to try a former president. Meanwhile, after an illuminating confirmation hearing before the Senate Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee yesterday, President Biden's controversial pick for director of White House Office and Management and Budget set before the Senate Budget Committee today for her second hearing. Joining me now to talk about all of this and more, Tyler O'Neill, senior editor at PJ Media. Tyler, welcome back to the program. Thanks. Glad to be here, Tony. All right. So uh, give our listeners a sense of what's happening today in the uh, impeachment hearing. Yeah. So today they're actually delving into the substance of the claim that uh, Trump is guilty of incitement of insurrection. So yesterday was the debate. They focused on whether or not the Senate has the constitutional authority to try the case. Now they're actually proceeding into trying the actual case. What was your take on yesterday's proceedings where the and the House managers arguing uh, mostly along emotional lines, but arguing that the Senate should take up the impeachment? Yeah, I'm I'm actually divided on that particular issue. Uh, because I think some of the Democratic arguments really don't don't resonate. Like they, they talk about this uh, January exception. They say that if Trump can't be uh, convicted by the Senate now, then there's this January exception for uh, presidential behavior. But in the in the last month of a presidency, I, I don't think that stands. I think uh, if if the president were to commit high crimes and misdemeanors, then he could be tried. Uh, legally for violating, you know, the Constitution for engaging in horrific acts. You know, there, there's no reason why uh, he couldn't be prosecuted for committing heinous acts against the country. But at the same time, you know, I think the Democrats have a decent argument when they say that, you know, Congress, the House of Representatives, passed the impeachment before the end of Trump's term. Of course, the real problem with that is Nancy Pelosi didn't send the article of impeachment over to the Senate until Joe Biden was already president. So, you know, this this whole thing is very partisan sham. Um, right. But, you know. That's... Well, even with even with the House taking it up before the president uh, left office, th- there were no hearings in the House. They just uh, the president, his people were not allowed to provide for, a, a, you know, a counter testimony. They just ran it through. Uh, And then also you have in the Senate where the Supreme Court justice is not presiding, which is called for in the Constitution. So all this seems uh, to me, it looks like political theater. Yeah, well, they made a mockery of due process, uh, as as you pointed out, and ran roughshod over all the precedents for impeachment by rushing to vote it, even though they didn't rush to vote it the day of or the day after uh, the Capitol riot, which was their original claim. They're like, well, we we have to get this done as soon as possible to remove him as soon as possible because he's a clear and present danger. It's like, well, if if he was a clear and present danger, why weren't you faster? And then at the same time, if this is a serious impeachment, why weren't you more thorough? Why didn't you at least have the beginning of an investigation as opposed to just rushing to impeach? And the specific claim that he incited the insurrection is just flat out bonkers if you look at the text of the speech. And, you know, there, there, there were bad things that Trump did on January 6th, but he certainly did not incite anything. Right. Well, I, I, I want to move on to uh, this controversial nominee, but I do want to ask you one more question on this, not suggesting that you can think like a liberal, but I, I, <laughs> seeing that a conviction is highly unlikely, why do you believe the Democrats are doing this? What do they have to gain? I think they, they want to gain one specific thing. They want the narrative that Republicans were involved in an insurrection against the government, uh, government of the United States. And with that narrative, they can push a 14th Amendment ouster of Senate Republicans, of House Republicans, or they can make the case to voters that essentially what we had was a Confederacy, a rebellion against the United States. Uh, that happened on January 6th. I think that's an asinine argument. Uh, 
but I think that is what they're going for. And my prediction, if you know that's what they're going for, that we're only going to see a further division of this country, possibly pushing it to a place where it's uh, irreparable. So, yeah, if Biden wanted real unity, the first thing he would do is say, stop this impeachment trial. He could, heck, he could even pardon Trump. And that way he would seem to be pushing unity while still claiming that Trump violated his oath, even though he doesn't have evidence. And, you know, like if if Biden wanted unity, he wouldn't be letting this happen. Yeah. Well, speaking of duplicity on behalf of President Biden, I want to transition over to one of his controversial nominees. And I want to play a clip from yesterday's hearing. Uh, This is this is Senator James Lankford. Uh, Bobby, play clip number three. President Biden, on his very first full day in office, stood in front of the staff of the White House and said this statement. I'm not joking when I say this. If you ever work with me and I hear you treat another colleague with disrespect, talk down to someone, I promise you I will fire you on the spot. On the spot. No ifs, ands, or buts. The challenge you have, obviously, is walking in some of your previous statements, as you've already mentioned. You actually have tweeted more in the past four years than President Trump tweeted as far as just numbers. And it's been pretty hostile, obviously. You've called Republicans criminally ignorant, corrupt, and the worst. And as you've already mentioned, over a thousand tweets have actually been deleted by you as you try to clear up. There's still a lot that's there as well. All that's partisan. I get that. I do have a concern, though, because some of the statements that you've made seem to drift out of the partisan issues. One statement that you made about uh, people that have the personal religious convictions about contraception, like Little Sisters of the Poor and others, called them a successful political cudgel helping isolate extreme advocates from the mainstream. That one seems to cross a different line for me. So help me understand how the personal religious beliefs of some Americans could be a successful political cudgel. Tyler, Neera Tandon is um, pretty far out there, former head of the Center for American Progress, a liberal think tank. Um, She's out there. Oh, yeah, no no question about it. And this is this is a very significant role uh, that Biden nominated her for. The director of the Office of Management and Budget goes through the regulations that are cooking in the federal government and analyzes just how much money they'll cost, how they'll impact the economy, various things like that. And so her her bias will lead to more excusing of big government largesse. And it, it seems of uh, quashing religious freedom. You know, I find this very interesting because the the, the previous uh, previously Russ vote had been at uh, OBM for uh, President Trump for the Trump administration. You might recall his first confirmation hearing when <laughs> Bernie Sanders. Uh, just yeah. told him that, you know, he was too religious and grilled him over his Christian faith and said that, uh, you know, he, he essentially said he was disqualified to serve in office. I mean, w- how the pendulum swings. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Bern- Bernie uh, came out and said, you know, you're you're not someone that this country is supposed to be about because Russ Vaught had the uh, had the temerity to say that only Jesus provides the way to salvation and that Islam does does not. And essentially, like you said, it, it was a religious test for office. Now, uh, Bernie Sanders is actually pushing near a Tandon because Tandon attacked him along with uh, the Republicans in her in her Twitter tirade. So I, I really think this might be the uh, the nominee that Biden loses. And it's possible that he chose uh, Tandon almost as a sacrificial lamb to be able to to move on and get some of his other radical nominees through without uh, as much scrutiny. But so that, do you, you think you <laughs> think there could end up you think there could be some uh, Democratic opposition? It's it's going to be tough to say uh, because the Democrats need every single vote and. They're not going to be happy with their caucus if if anybody breaks. But I could see Bernie Sanders not accepting her statements, her apologies at face value, and uh, this this nominee getting scuttled.
It's possible. Well, and, and if she is shown to be, and, and, and certainly her comments would suggest, hostility toward religion, um, you know, Joe Manchin is one who has uh, been very defensive about religious freedom. It's uh, potentially, uh, you know, I don't know if he's made any statements, but he could be one that could vote against her. Yeah, he could be. And I mean, I, I would hope so. All right. Anything Manchin else we should be looking anything else we should be looking out for, uh, Tyler? Well, <laughs> there, there's always a lot. Um, but, yeah, th- those are the main the main things. And watch for Democrat hypocrisy on the impeachment. I think there's a good argument about the riots last summer and the double standard that they're pushing against Trump in this. Yeah, that doesn't seem to phase them one bit. But uh, we will be watching. Believe me. Trust me. We will. Tyler O'Neill, as always, great to have you on the program. 